So I really do have a love-hate relationship with language. Um, I really can't stop reading. I'm addicted to reading, and I'm finding it increasingly difficult to not be spellbound or sort of brought into the spell of language um, because it's, it's very easy to start thinking that thoughts are certain and that they somehow could ever provide um, some sense of, of finality or, or, you know, a finished product or, you know, a system for all time or whatever, you know, that thought could ever construct the truth. Because construction itself is always inherently, you know, it's not objective. You're building your own desire into the world and you're not seeing it for what it is, which that's truth. And if thought is always construction, you can't ever behold the truth. In other words, it's there before you try to reach for it. It's just, you just open your eyes and it's there. Thought is inherently chasing something. And the truth seems to be something that could only ever be ever present, right? available at all times because what could be here but the truth and if we're ever lost in thought as though the truth were something we lacked and had to find we're obviously under some kind of a delusion or illusion and certainly it's a self-induced illusion and if it's a self-induced uh, illusion then we can uninduce it but um all that being said, let's talk about huge piles of words with really thick books that are really trying to figure it out. But this is an interesting case. This is something important, I think, maybe. Philosophy in the Flesh by George Lakoff and Mark Johnson. Now, in a sense, it's ruined philosophy for me. In another sense, it's made it a lot more interesting and a lot more useful. Um, Lakoff and Johnson are both really into Wittgenstein and Dewey because they think they are one of the or two of the few philosophers in the last century to really um, understand what a science of the body meant, a science of the brain meant, a science of language meant. Um, Lakoff, Lakoff and Johnson's uh, real enemies in this book are traditional Enlightenment, Cartesian, philosophers. Um, you know, people like Marvin Minsky and uh, Douglas Hofstadter, who are computer scientists, um, they do certain, you know, Noam Chomsky isn't necessarily a computer scientist, but he constructed the theory of grammar, which allowed uh, the computer scientists to think as though they, they could build an artificial intelligence or a brain made of computer chips and software um, and see the trick here is that all software is some kind some type of formal language and a formal language is it's just um, a set of, of um, either mathematical digits or just you know a form a shape which in itself has no meaning but which when given a set of rules in which to interact with other shapes it just does its thing you know, depending on the inputs and whatever. So that idea was applied to what the human brain does when it thinks. And, you know, what it kind of necessitates is that there's some language of thought, some computer code made up of symbols which themselves have no meanings, but which get paired up with sensory experiences uh, in a... Um, in a way in which over time it just gets more accurate at predicting what's going to happen out there. But see, Lakoff and Johnson want to point out that there is an inherent a priori philosophical assumption behind that science. It's computer science, and computer science is, is based on the real traditions of Western philosophy which hold that, that, that there is this essence of mind the formal structure of symbols, um, which is somehow separate from the world and can be 
in, in, in some way ontologically prior to or simply outside of the world as it exists and the body and the structure of the brain. Computer scientists think it, you can model the brain on anything, you know, on, on silicone. It doesn't have to be an organic structure like the human brain. Um, but what Lakoff and Johnson want to point out is that all of our metaphors, including the metaphors that thought is language, um, that um, the mind is a collection of symbols and that somehow human language is a formal language or a code of some kind made up of symbols that have no inherent meaning in themselves. So there's a real, a real dualism between form and substance in this traditional Western view. And Lakoff says this can't be. That framework itself, the separation between mind and body, or form and substance, is, is a metaphor that is, is rooted in the structure of our perceptual systems, our visual systems, you know, our, uh, the way that we feel our bodies in the world provide the base for our metaphors, which we use for, you know, the most abstract of conceptualizations. And so to think that those conceptualizations are somehow outside the world looking in at, you know, the objective outside external world, that from the beginning, it's just a metaphor. We have no empirical proof of any such existing outside physical world and you know when we say physical world it's less of um, an assumption than saying a material externally existing world physical really just means well it's generally law-abiding which yeah of course it's generally law-abiding but there are many specific cases of novelty and that you always have to remember that science True science, legitimate science, is, is about the general patterns of nature. It's not about the ultimate, um, you know, uncrossable barriers or uh, laws written in stone. They're just habits. The laws are general. You can have a science about anything if that's your definition of science. A science of consciousness, of experience, of language, whatever. You're just looking for patterns in behavior. You don't make any assumptions beside that. And that's all that Lakoff and Johnson are really trying to do. They're looking at the structure of the brain. Instead of assuming that thought could be modeled by a computer, they're saying, well, let's just look at what it is modeled with as not even a model at all, but the actual process of thought itself, what we're trying to understand. It's in a brain. It doesn't happen on computer chips. So let's look at neurons. Neurons are just on, off. Uh, switches, really. But, see, we, we are born with more connections than at any other time we will have in our lives. And as we come out of the womb and start having experiences, those connections which aren't used, they die off. And the connections with, which are used, they become, you know, more permanent. So to say that we're born somehow innately wired to speak a language like Chomsky does is is another assumption because we're not innate we're innately wired to do anything we're not a blank slate we have a biological history and, and a genetic uh, sequence that in some way confines our development but language is a very technical skill that must, in a sense, be drilled into us. Thought must be drilled into us from the outside. It's not innate. 